And welcome Dr. Sarah Klein uh, from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we're gonna hear a lot about marine reserves tonight. I think Sarah's been with ODFW since about January. Is that about right? Um, and I know Jeff and Fran and some other folks have been involved with the marine reserves. And I will stop talking now. Then welcome Sarah. Thank you. Well, I'm glad that you all recognize the land sea connections here because I know a lot of watershed councils focus very much on riparian and forest management. So thanks for inviting me to talk about how, well, we all know that there's connectivity and there's some species in the ocean that's been part of their life in the estuaries and it's all connected. So thanks for inviting me to speak with you and um, motivating me to put together my first slide deck for a non-scientist audience since I started this job, which is a good motivator for me. All right, so. Okay, my name is Sarah Klein. I'm the Human Dimensions Project Lead for the Marine Research Program at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I am an ecological economist different from environmental economists, and I could talk for an entire hour or more about those differences, but I will save you that story right now. I am also a conservation social scientist. I also like to dress my children up as crustaceans for Halloween. I occasionally catch fish mostly for science, but sometimes for fun. I like to eat seafood, locally caught and sustainably caught, and I'm an enthusiastic beginner surfer now that I've moved to Newport. So that's been a challenge, but a good way to connect with the ocean. And you will probably see me uh, on the weekends at the aquarium since my family goes about once a month to the aquarium. So I'm here today because I want to talk about where we are and paths to where we want to go. And this is a framework way of thinking that can apply to all sorts of different contexts. But basically, I see the human predicament now as um, we need all of the science that we can get our hands onto and artists and everyone else to have a better understanding of where we are and where we want to go. And this blue circle in my slide represents the realm of the, the possibility, the space that's possible. And as a scientist, I want to shed light on these yellow trajectories, on what is possible based on the laws of physics and also constraints. And I think a lot of social constraints may seem overwhelming now, but we have to remember that human systems change and human values change. So this possibility space can also shift over time. So I see my job as trying to better understand where we are trying to work with other people to figure out where we want to go and work out these paths, these steps in the right direction towards a more sustainable, more just, and more vibrant world. And this talk is going to be heavily influenced by a podcast that I listened to recently. It was the Great Simplification Podcast interview. Uh, Nate Hagen's interviewed Jonathan Rosen who um, is a writer. He was also a chess grandmaster. And he introduced me to, I have to give you a little jargon warning. The next slide is a little jargony, but it's kind of fun jargon. And um, this is why I wanted my notes since I just read and learned about this recently. So I am not an expert, but I'm here to today to relate these big concepts to what we do on the coast of Oregon. So, um, I'm going to talk about modernism and postmodernism and meta modernism from this podcast that I listened to recently. And I, I know this is a lot of like woo woo jargon, but um, I think it's really important. So, modernism is this idea of an orientation that is future looking, it's based on science, it's based on reason, it's based on like the principles from the Enlightenment, it's based on this notion of progress, of like, Everything's getting better every year. We're making progress. We're, you know, uh, making reducing world hunger and increasing education rates, and everything is moving and we're getting better. And then you get the critique of modernism, 
which is Posma. It's critiquing everything and it's looking at the shadows of modernism. It's looking at the negative externalities associated with notions of progress. So it's looking at colonialism and it's it's looking at things like the mining that goes on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo to get the cobalt and the lithium necessary for our cell phones and our computers and our way of life. Postmodernism is critiquing the dark side of modernism. And sometimes postmodernism ranges into like, I don't know, some postmodern plays make me a little crazy. I remember reading Waiting for Godot in high school and I was like, what is this? And then like, there's some like, Nietzsche, like life has no meaning and it just feels empty. And and it's, I don't find postmodernism, I think it's important, but it's not ultimately motivating or satisfying. So this new idea that I just learned about in this podcast, it's reconciling modernism with postmodernism with this idea of metamodernism. So meta is a word from the ancient Greeks. Meta can translate to be after, within, between, beyond. And meta, meta modernism is a way to reconcile kind of these two vibes <laughs> and come up with this other vibe, this other meta modern vibe. And let me make this really concrete because I know this is very abstract. But if you think about modernism, Seinfeld is quintessentially modernism. Like nobody really grows up. Nobody really makes tough decisions. It's it's a little shallow, but it's it's entertaining. It's funny. Um, and postmodernism, or I should say metamodernism, uh, postmodernism, sorry, my slides messed up. Postmodernism would be like waiting for Godot, Nietzsche, um, often art venturing into the like, life doesn't have much meaning. What are we doing here? Whereas postmodernism, or sorry, metamodernism, that's really encapsulated in that movie, Don't Look Up, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it because it's funny and there's irony and there's sarcasm, but at the end of the day, like there's these characters you end up really caring about. And it really is about coming together as an asteroid is barreling towards the earth and community and love and this um, reverence for life. And it gets into deeper themes. So. I'm trying to take a meta-modern <laughs> approach to my job, which can be fun at times, but it's also, I think, um, it's a less naive way of proposing a way forward, of proposing ways to get to that more sustainable, more just, more vibrant place that in my heart and others who I have connected with, we want to get to that place. So I encourage you to, I mean, the, the podcast I listen to really explains it way better than I do. Um, and there's lots of books and essays out there, but I, I think these are interesting ideas worth really sitting with and thinking about how it can relate to the to the work you do and, and achieving goals both individually and collectively. So in terms of the marine reserves, let's take this back from this meta-modernism place. Um, I want to really focus on where we are because many of you in this room played a really important role in getting the Marine Reserve to where we are now. I mean, it, it, also, I, I will be the first to tell you that my position at ODFW is incredibly unusual. I don't know of a single other full-time employee who is a social scientist dedicated to understanding how Marine Reserves impact humans. California doesn't have a full-time me. They mostly just look at fisheries and they don't think about other communities in the coast. Um, and they might even restructure their program to look more like Oregon, which is interesting. So in any case, I wanna really delve into where we are with the reserves. So globally, this is a map of the planet with uh, done by the Marine Conservation Institute, looking at marine protected areas around the world. There's 2.9% of the ocean area that's an implemented and it's fully or highly protected zones. Um, it's hard to see Oregon's marine reserves because they're in the global picture quite small, but we are part of this bigger global effort to protect the ocean and to protect marine biodiversity in the ocean. 
So Oregon Marine Reserves, uh, Cape Falcon, Cascade Head, Otter Rock, Cape Perpetua, Redfish Rocks. We have five marine reserves. These are marine reserves where there are full-time people at ODFW to track ecological changes and to track changes in human dimensions. It's all in state waters. State waters extends from the beach to three miles offshore, to the coastline to three miles offshore. Marine reserves are 3% of this nearshore environment and they are no take, no harvesting, no development. Marine protected areas are 6% of the nearshore and there are limited takes and the uh, policy is different in each location that you look at up and down the coast. There's other types of marine reserves or other type of marine managed areas and it can get very confusing. Um, and DLCD just led this Rocky Shores initiative to further map and characterize them. I can go into those details later, but my job is to look at these five marine reserves and we can talk marine gardens and other Rocky intertidal zones after my talk if you want. So the goals. The goals of Oregon Marine Reserves. Um, it's important to note what's on this list and what's not on this list. So let's start with what's on this list. Conservation, conserve habitats and biodiversity. That's the primary goal of Oregon's Marine Reserves. Sorry about that. Secondary goal, research. They are a place to learn. They're a place to serve as scientific reference sites and we can get information that can inform both the marine protected area and marine reserve management, as well as more general nearshore ocean management decisions. Um, just as some like really interesting research that's gone on in these marine reserves, we work with oceanographers that put sensors in to measure dissolved oxygen and uh, hypoxia and temperature. So they're, they're like places where we're listening to what's going on in the ocean, and uh, we can listen in a place that's not also impacted by fishing. So it's a place to be able to parse out anthropogenic impacts from extractive industries versus just general changes in the marine environment. We've had some really alarming, I should say, changes with uh, hypoxic events and uh, marine heat waves um, since the marine reserves were established. So. Um, it's important to note these sites are areas for learning. They're also uh, a goal of the marine reserves was to avoid significant adverse impacts to people, to ocean users and coastal communities. So what's not on this list? What's not on this list is a tool for fisheries management. It has never been a goal for Oregon's marine reserves to um, result in spillover, so benefits to fisheries from protecting fish in an area. It's great if it happens, but that was not an explicit goal when they were created. Um, if you look at marine protected area and marine reserve literature from the tropical areas of the world, often fisheries management is an explicit goal. I would also argue that ODFW has learned a lot in the last 20 to 30 years, maybe longer than that. I'm pretty new. So they've been learning the whole time. But basically, I, what I want to say is, uh, from my experience there, I am actually pretty confident that ODFW is doing a solid job to sustainably manage fishing stocks. And if you have an environment where fisheries are managed pretty sustainably, you don't get as strong of a signal in terms of increasing fisheries abundance and diversity from a marine reserve than if you're in a place that's overfished. So um, I want you to know conservation research and avoiding adverse impacts to communities are the three goals. They're not a fisheries management tool. And this is kind of a paradigm shift a little bit for what ODFW does since ODFW um, was, at least the marine program was much more fisheries oriented and managing fisheries. Now, this program and some other work were habitat management and habitat observation and habitat monitoring group at ODFW. And that's that's a big shift for a government agency be, to be looking at non-extractive uh, uses and habitat rather than just focusing on managing extractive uses. So as I've alluded to, the creation of the marine reserves, if you can boil it, reduce it, 
in all of its complexity to just balancing a couple of things. It's really trying to balance biodiversity conservation with commercial and recreational fishing interests and uh, development of other sorts. Um, nowadays, that proposed maybe on the horizon, who knows what's going to happen. Renewable energy is in the picture now or running cables through that three mile zone and also, um, you know, just working out policies related to ocean based renewable energy. So, uh, it's a balancing act to figure out um, how big to make these, what size and what spacing in order to achieve those biodiversity goals, but also to be socially acceptable to the fishing communities, both recreational and commercial, um, in order to have that community support and avoid adverse uh, socioeconomic impacts. So uh, this graphic is uh, the Marine Reserves Program. We've got um, a uh, management policy and administrator position. We've got an ecological monitoring team. I lead the human dimensions research program, and we're soon going to have a full-time permanent public affairs position doing communication and outreach. We work with multiple partners. We've worked a lot in collaboration with universities and nonprofits. We uh, contract fishermen to bring us out for some of the hook and line surveys that we do, and we work with the fishing industry in other ways. We've got lots of volunteers that come out with us. If you're interested in being part of our hook and line team, let us know. You get to go catch fish for science in a marine reserve and let them go. And we try to keep them alive as best as we can uh, to just monitor the populations over time. We have lots of fellows and uh, student interns. And in fact, in the audience members, my newest Sea Grant fellow who just started two days ago. So I'm very glad that she can be here. That's Amanda up there. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got private sector contractors and marine reserve community groups. So um, if you're interested, there's some really great community groups out there, the Cape Perpetual Collaborative, the uh, Marine, uh, the uh, Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve works and collaborates with us. Uh, the North Coast Land Conservancy is our community group connected to the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. And uh, it's been really fun for me to just learn about these various uh, conservation and community group initiatives and citizen science work that connects to the marine reserves. And then we've also got our state agency management partners with state parks and DLCD for signage and other work and management that's done. So to put some faces to some of these uh, positions in the structure of the Oregon Marine Reserves Program, Mo Schmidt uh, is the ecology team lead. We also have Stephen, Stephanie Fields and Brian Fields, not related, even though they have the same last name. <laughs> Me, Sarah Klein, and uh, Tommy Swearingen is quasi retired, but he's like a boomerang. He goes away and comes back and goes away and comes back. And he has helped me learn more history of the Oregon coast. Like without him, I uh, would be so much less informed. So it's been really great to learn with him. And uh, Sam, Sam Chuck, like I didn't have time to put Amanda's new face on this slide yet, but that will happen soon. Um, and we've got the outreach and engagement um, position that will be filled shortly. Um, so that's that's who we are. That's the team. And um, what do we do? Well, we monitor ecological change over time. We look at invertebrates, fish, macroalgae, habitat, and oceanography. They use various uh, methods, including scuba diving, video landers, hook and line surveys, as well as remotely operated vehicle to look at fish and invert and other species populations, both within the marine reserves and in um, nearby areas that were selected as comparison areas with similar habitat, but without the marine reserve uh, label or for policies managing it. Um, so we protect different types of uh, post uh, marine fish habitat and communities. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the dominant species, the abundance of um, black rockfish varies across our marine reserves. Um, and Cape Perpetua has a heck of a lot more copper rockfish than the other reserves. So um, each reserve is different. We tried to get, get reserves with different types of habitat represented. Um, and we're monitoring those populations of uh, marine species over time. So the program that I lead up is the Human Dimensions Program, and we're looking at how is the Oregon coast changing over time, how is it connected to um, ocean industries, 
Um, and there's a lot of things. And this is a little bit of an overwhelming table, but basically a conservation social scientist like myself gets to choose among a lot of different topics for doing research. And my predecessor, Tommy Swearingen, he had an incredible number of collaborators in academia, and he did research projects that connected to one or many of this wide array of topics um, to look at human dimensions of understanding how marine reserves impact people. And it's at various spatial scales on various units of analysis across various topics. So there's a lot going on there. In a nutshell, though, if you're really interested in learning more about the decade of human dimensions research that my predecessor led, I encourage you to check out the human dimensions research chapter within the Marine Reserves Program Synthesis Report. I'm going to give you some very high level summaries without getting into the massive number of academic public and reports that have been done looking at so many different angles of these issues. So in a nutshell, my big picture summary of the big changes over the creation of the Marine Reserves is that when the negotiations began to uh, create these no-take zones of the ocean, it was highly contentious. And there's a lot of fishermen who felt threatened by these reserves and they worried that they would lose their livelihoods. And you also have to understand the context. There have been enormous changes with the ground fish fleet restructuring and so many other things that was after kind of like a lot of fish caught in the 70s and 80s that would, you know, in hindsight, you look at it and you're like, yep, that was not at a sustainable level. So they had to make some modifications and the marine reserves were created on the tail end of a lot of this ground fish turmoil. Um, so fishermen were already dealing with a lot of stressors. So back then the marine reserves and the very idea of it was highly contentious. There's a lot of concern of impacts to fisheries and there's even businesses who, who gave loans to fishermen. And some of the banks were concerned that the marine reserves were going to have a negative impact on their business, on their bank. Now, there's pretty broad support across the state and the coast. And some evidence of that is that the Coastal Caucus legislators unanimously supported the passage of House Bill 4132 to expand the budget for the marine reserves program and to basically secure the future of this program, to really institutionalize it. Before House Bill 4132, the future wasn't 100% clear. And now it's like, we are funded, we are moving into the future, we've got the mandate of what we've got to do. We're a program and we're here to stay. So that's pretty exciting. I will also say something that Tommy Swearingen and many, many others use all sorts of different methods to get at this question of like, how are the marine reserves going to impact fisheries? How did they impact fisheries? I don't want to tell you about the 20 papers, but like there's a before and after study done with as much data as possible that they could get. There's been modeling done of the uh, economic value of ocean space. And to the best of our ability to gather data on this topic, we have not found empirical evidence of port level or state level changes to fish landing that can directly be attributed to the creation, the implementation and maintenance of these reserves. I will note though, that still to this day, a small number of fishermen, can't see the slide, but uh, some fishermen maintain um, negative attitudes and claim that it hurt them individually. And, I read the thesis that was about interviewing eight of these guys in Depot Bay, and they felt like their favorite, most convenient fishing grounds were taken away from them. At a port level or state level, though, if you look at all of the fishing that's going on, people were able to drive their boat a little bit longer, go to a different place, and as I said, we haven't found evidence that it negatively impacted the amount of fish landing. So uh, another piece of evidence that I have to support my claim that attitudes towards the marine reserves have changed over time and 
uh, is based on a survey I've done of about 817 Oregonians. This is a representative sample. We did two recruitment methods to do this online survey. And we asked the question, should the area dedicated to marine reserves be reduced, left unchanged, or expanded? This is a general population. So you could argue not many of these general public people have skin in the game when it comes to marine reserves. However, it's their general opinion. And in general, more people uh, responded on the survey saying that they would, the, the blue is left unchanged, the turquoise is slightly increased, and the light blue is significantly increased. So this is some evidence of broad support across the state for these conservation, these marine reserves. <clears throat> and it's over half um, voted or in the survey said either slightly increased or significantly increased, which I thought was really interesting. So my program um, has done quite a bit of tracking awareness, knowledge, and support of the marine reserves. And uh, there's this pretty high level of support, but <laughs> uh, people are more or less aware of the marine reserves, but they can't tell you how many there are. They can't tell you their names, and they really don't much about it. So it's more of like a general positive feeling about them without actually knowing that much. Um, and we also found out that traveling to the coast, we did this visitor intercept survey where we go out to the coast and go to um, basically like uh, state parks have signage explaining the marine reserves at iconic places along the coast. And we intercepted visitors there and we asked them what motivated them to come to the Oregon coast. Guess what? Visiting marine reserves is not a driver of tourism <laughs> uh, for various reasons. They go for the beach, for the coast. Uh, we can't pretend that this is like making tourism explode across the coast of Oregon because it's really not. That's okay because it's providing all these other benefits to learning and for conservation. So, okay, and getting to like my personal vision with my little budget that I get to allocate for 2024 to 2025 in working towards this more sustainable, more just, more vibrancy, I've decided to focus on, um, focus, <laughs> five projects. <laughs> because that's not much focus, but it's really been great for uh, getting collaborators at various other institutions. So. Um, I spearheaded this Oregonian perceptions of coastal carbon habitat and marine reserves. I've also got a project with OSU on these marine protected area global principles and how do they relate to the Oregon way of creating these MPAs and marine reserves. I've got a project going on in Port Orford right now looking at how redfish rocks contributes economically to Curry County and the port. Um, I'm supporting work research to do this Latinx ocean values work and um, of six <laughs> metrics that matter is this project to look at the um, ongoing monitoring protocol and think really hard about human well-being and a broader, more holistic set of social indicator data that we can collect to look at how well-being might or might not be connected to the marine reserves. And then I've got this other project seeing the marine reserves. So really quickly uh, this survey that i led um, with other collaborators is focusing on blue carbon habitat so that's seagrass no mangroves that i know of in oregon yet we'll see what happens with climate change <laughs> seagrass uh tidal estuaries and i did include kelp which cycles a lot of carbon and there's preliminary science showing that like there is some quantity of kelp that breaks up and then floats down to the deep sea, the exact amount and the rate at which it deposits carbon deep underwater isn't totally clear. But for the purpose of this social science survey, I did include kelp in my blue carbon habitat survey. And um, I looked at to what extent Oregonians support nature-based coastal climate mitigation efforts and to what extent do they uh, support expanding or reducing the spatial footprint of the marine reserves. I also, I had a willingness to pay component for expanding blue carbon habitat, and I'm working with an economist right now on the results of that survey. Um, and the experimental part was including um, a human well-being component. So we use a choice experiment 
uh, and um, the economic methods to estimate willingness to pay. And then we also had this more experimental um, aspect of the survey where we asked how much does it contribute to your overall well-being and we dug into that so it's trying to get away from reducing the value of nature to dollars but to think about it more holistically and um i'll keep you posted as we work through the 1097 responses from oregonians and um i should have some results to report in another month or two on that project the second project is related to this MPA guide that was published in science, I think it's science, um, which is a, this global framework to achieve global conservation goals for the ocean. They identify various principles or enabling conditions. And we're doing this qualitative analysis to see to what extent did what transpired in Oregon in the planning process align with these global enabling principles that experts have identified? And then is there something from how marine reserves were created in Oregon that could be of insight and useful to uh, a global community, to others attempting to create networks or systems of marine reserves in other places. This third um, Redfish Rocks Economic Contributions to Port Orford builds off of a 2013 report. So we're looking at the economic benefits of non-extractive activities associated with the reserves. Usually you do input output analysis with extractive industries and producing something. Here we're doing the, um, we're assessing economic data on all of the expenditures related to scientific studies, monitoring, planning efforts, as well as tourism that directly connects to the marine reserves. So really my thought in doing this one is to provide a bullet point of uh, robust methods used to identify the economic contribution of this no-take area to a small community like uh, Port Orford. And if it works well, we might do this coastwide in another year or two. This Latinx ocean conservation values has entailed working with Oregon State University researchers, um, interviewing people who belong to, I just learned recently that um, it's Latinx isn't that uh, acceptable of a term, so I need to change that to Latino, and I also need to talk with more people to make sure that's not omitting uh, females and putting the O on the end of it. In any case, um, there's been, uh, an initial study that TNC um, helped to fund with these researchers, and I'm um, working with these uh, researchers at OSU to expand it to another port. She started a new port, and I'm funding her to go to, uh, going to be either Tillamook or Coos Bay to do more interviews with members of Latinx communities to understand what do they value about the ocean, what could would be good ways to get more Latino and Latina representation and planning processes moving forward, and also to better understand, you know, their role in the process, fish processing, um, that's really important for a lot of our um, fish processing efforts on the coast. So uh, trying to expand who we work with um, and make it a little more diverse here. And then this project metrics that matter marine reserves and human well-being. I'm working with UC Davis. They have this environmental policy management program um, and also the Center for Community and Citizen Science. We're going to be um, learning lots more about various um, human well-being outcomes associated with marine protected areas and marine reserves and looking at both positive and negative human well-being outcomes and trying to figure out what makes sense for Oregon in terms of social indicator data to collect so we can better understand how marine reserves are impacting human well-being. We're going to run focus groups in coastal communities to try to work with people I, I, hopefully I can invite you all to come to one of these focus groups um, and get your input on what are the domains of human well-being that connect to marine reserves? Does it make sense to collect this kind of data long term? Um, yeah, so that should be an interesting project for this winter and spring. And then this last one, um, <laughs> it's a little harebrained, but it's totally fun and it's getting into the meta modern here. So um, this is with uh, Danny Pimentel at University of Oregon and the Journal School of Journalism and Communication. And it was my harebrained idea of like, okay, we've got these marine reserves. 
you go to a marine reserve, if you're just a tourist who just wants to go to the beach, you go to the sign and you look at, at the marine reserve and guess what? It's mostly all ocean and you don't know what's in the marine reserve and what's out of the marine reserve. So why don't we use augmented reality and play around with what our phones can do for us? So I've got this pilot project where my vision, and I'm working it out with what's possible, these UFO folks, they have a lot of really smart techie people that are helping me out with this. My vision is that you'll be able to go to Otter Rocks, this pilot project, use your smartphone, there's gonna be a QR code on a sign, and it'll take you to a website, and the website will access your camera, and you'll have a view of the ocean, and the boundaries of the marine reserves will be projected onto the water on your phone. And then wacky Pokemon-like <laughs> cartoons that are much better um, made into the Oregon version, not what I found on the internet prepared for this talk, will appear on your screen and you can click on it and learn more about red octopus and learn more about canary rockfish or whatever the rock the fish are that are most common in that particular marine reserve and um, the professor involved with this told me like he, <laughs> the creators of pokemon have a film they're really playing and they're interested in this project so we really might get some like pokemon like characters <laughs> appearing on phones of visitors on the Oregon coast so I'm, I'm, this is my most meta modern project <laughs> that i'm really having fun with so in getting back to where we are, where we want to go, trying to figure out these pathways towards more just, more sustainable, more vibrant ecosystems, human communities, um, I want to talk to you about this next stage of what we're doing, what we're mandated to do by that house bill, and that is adaptive management. Like we've institutionalized these marine reserves, and now it's time to figure out, okay, what's next? How do we adapt? What do we need to change? Where do we go from here? And um, I want to point you, thanks for mentioning this to me, to Oregon Planning, DLCD has these 18, 19, ah, the last one was cut off, and that's important. <laughs> Sorry about this, but I do want to emphasize how with our adaptive, plan adaptive planning, we want to really embrace this goal one of citizen involvement in the adaptive management planning process for the marine reserves and ocean sustainability is gold line team that was cut off of this slide, sorry about that. <laughs> so we're keeping an eye on what California has done. They are in the middle of their adaptive management planning process. They had a very specific way that they organized it. They had evaluation criteria, they had the ability for groups of people, whether it's NGOs or scientists, to come together to propose specific changes. The changes are going to be evaluated based on scientifically defined criteria, and they're working through the various proposals to their MPA and Marine Reserve System. We haven't decided if we're just going to like do what California did or really do an Oregon way kind of adaptive management. So that's to be determined, but um, getting people involved, getting uh, building a shared vision of where we want to go and how it's going to be more just, more sustainable, more vibrant, I think is key to doing adaptive management well and to being open-minded and figuring out how do we balance these competing interests while also protecting biodiversity. So on that note, I'm going to make this really meta-modern, and this is where I needed my notes because I just literally learned about metamodernism quite recently. Um, so just momentarily here. Um, again, this idea of metamodernism, it's an attempt to reconcile modernism and postmodernism with something new. Um, and it's, it's, it's creating a vision forward that's not naive. Um, and I'll be the first to tell you, ODFW, we're taking baby steps, but man, there is so much more we can do to include more indigenous voices in our planning processes. And we also know that fishermen are facing a lot of stressors. It's not like stress in the fishing industry. You know, it's it's a tough industry. There's a lot of things going on right now, especially consolidation and concentration and uncertainty about the future and 
tough recruiting young people into it. So we we got to work with the fishing industry if, in this adaptive management planning process. But to get to this meta modernism thing, I think we we still we got to work on creating that shared positive vision of the marine reserves. And um, I think we can do this and we can do this with like just being really clear and in a meta modern way, like there's still these virtues that I want to try to embed in this process, like working towards more justice, working with hopefully some kind of like truth or at least understanding that there are multiple viewpoints that are valid and that we got to consider a wide variety of perspectives to move forward. And I also hope that we can include some irony and placefulness as we envision this future. And who knows, maybe I'll get those Pokemon philanthropists to like <laughs> help me do visioning for this adaptive management planning process. We'll see. I do think though that this, this, the, these steps forward, this adaptive management step forward, it's an opportunity for experimentation and also for using our imagination to think about what is that more just, more sustainable, more vibrant place where we want to go. And I don't know about you, but this past week has been a little interesting. It's been a little challenging. And sometimes I feel like it's absurd and ridiculous. But I also think that no matter your political inclination, that we all care a lot about Oregon's people and ecosystems. And we gotta we gotta treat each other with dignity, even if we don't agree with each other. Because we have a lot of hard questions to grapple with together and figuring out where we want to go. So I just want to give one more, you know, like metamodernism, it recognizes and is kind of fascinated with how we have to contend with all of these problems that are kind of at an overwhelming magnitude with biodiversity loss and climate changes. I feel overwhelmed by those issues at times, but we have to remember how much we can change and we have to think about what are our spheres of influence. And I have to remind myself like how much has changed, not just, you know, marine reserves are pretty widely accepted now. And uh, we also, even bigger picture, like we've changed society radically in the past. It's not like we're gonna be stuck in one way moving into the future. If anything, we gotta be ready for change and we gotta be adaptive to that kind of change. And I also wanna give a shout out to Midcoast Watershed Council, which I see as playing a major role in changing how people relate to our forests and estuaries and coastal areas here on the coast of Oregon. Um, I recently lived as a professor in a place with very few watershed councils, and I was attempting to collaborate on this project, and there was nothing like a watershed council in the area. And we all recognized how necessary it was to work with the people upstream and downstream. And it's been, in many ways, refreshing to move back to Oregon, where this idea of a watershed council is not radical. It's pretty accepted. And this is the kind of thing we need to get people to come together to talk about the upstream and the downstream and how it's all connected and how we can play a role in it. So we might be on a runaway train when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions and global biodiversity loss, but man, we have to find that diamond card. And we have to find it local and do place-based work to steward our home. So I hope uh, to do what I can in this Marine Reserves program to work towards this more sustainable, more just, more vibrant world. And, you know, lately, especially lately, it's felt a little dark and difficult at times. And um, I'm just doing what I can to find that. I don't use the language of hope anymore because I feel like hope is naive. I think the word that I prefer is resolve. Um, and you just, we got to dig to find that resolve, come together and make collectively more steps towards that more just, sustainable, vibrant destination, and maybe even find some a little shred of hope and joy in that shred. So thank you for inviting me to talk here. I hope I didn't prattle a lot about metamodernism too much, and I'm happy to field any questions and um, tell you more about what we do. Thanks. Question. The, the folks on Zoom can't hear the audience. So. Sure. Any questions? I would like to say that was great. <laughs> you can repeat that. <laughs> so needed and welcome. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm more on the extroverted side. So I get energy from sharing what I feel really strongly about. So I appreciate your uh, appreciation. Go ahead, Brent. Thank you. That was great, Sarah. Uh, first thing, keep on surfing. <laughs> it will energize you. Are you a surfer? Yeah. <laughs> sort of. So probably I'm going to hang in there. Uh, it will energize you. But you talked about well that you're you you have a really interesting process between social G and economics. We're just talking about the solve or how we how we motivate to meet these challenging times and kind of downplay the economics and focus on more aesthetics. I don't remember your words that. This room is behind us, probably. But there's a lot of people who don't have a science background or they're not as interested in these things. It's all about economics. So I would encourage you and others in your space and field of technological economics uh, to meet people where they are. People that we need to convince to do more things. They think it's all about dollars. <laughs> and so the economics of ecosystem services, that's that's the part that we have to craft as far as getting more people on board. If you're just resisting, it's all about dollars. Uh, so I'm I know that's a lot to try and repeat, but I'm, I guess my question is. Is what what do you think is kind of the state of the science of logical or environmental economics and the ability to communicate that? Okay, so your question, if I reduce it considerably, is how do we better communicate with people who are primarily motivated by economic interests? when it comes to conservation. Yeah. I was a professor and my job title was professor of ecosystem services. And then I learned more and more and was like, nope, I don't want that title in my job anymore. I also didn't want to stay in Utah because it's way too dry and way too conservative. But I have thought a lot about the concept of ecosystem services. And I really think in the right context, it's quite useful. It's often about modeling what nature does in a producer consumer framework to motivate policymakers at least the ideal behind it with Gretchen Daly and Paul Ehrlich among the people who really launched that idea of the millennium ecosystem assessment in 2005 it was to raise awareness that nature provides these specific concrete benefits to humans and we're destroying nature and therefore destroying some of the life support system, or at least the man-made alternatives are quite expensive, like water filtration plants and seven forests. Where that runs into problems, like there, there's many issues with the ecosystem service framework, in my opinion. I, now that I'm much older than when I first started grad school, and I was like, ecosystem services is gonna save the world. I feel like now I have a much more better, modern perspective on it because I think it perpetuates the, the producer-consumer metaphor that has gotten us into this predicament in the very first place. And the, the values that resonate more with me now that I've read way more about the topic is notions of stewardship, responsibility, reciprocity, and non-extractive ways of being in this world um, and I realized that that is not going to connect with finance folks and investors and the people who have a lot of power in our society. Uh, and I've, if I can take my ODFW hat off because I know this is not part of ODFW whatsoever, but I, it, to me, it just, uh, 
As an ecological economist, the evidence to me points to a need to deeply reform the systems that we're in so that we don't have to always grow in order to reduce, in order to uh, have good well-being. Basically, if the economy is shrinking, there's a lot of people suffering given the way that our society is structured right now. And we have to figure out how to get over that issue. Um, I could talk for hours about this topic. So I know there's other people. I'm just trying to think about like the take home points here. Um, ecosystem services are useful in the right context. However, human values are fickle and even market values are fickle. There's a lot of literature about, you know, um, ways in which people in the short run find technical substitutes for the benefits that nature can provide, but they're not viable long-term solutions. Like hand pollinating apples in an orchard in China and then all the bees are dead and then the, there's a factory that opens nearby so the workers go to make more money at the factory and then the apple farmers are spurred. So that's a very specific anecdote um, illustrating a broader principle. I hope that as, uh, well, the consequences of climate change are going to become more and more frequent and severe. I hope that we develop other accounting metrics in order to motivate more carbon sequestration, more carbon capture and storage over time. And maybe that ecosystem services framework can help advance climate mitigation. It's, uh, there's a lot of complexity in these issues though. So let, let, let's talk more about this later. <laughs> but again, I'll get off my soapbox in just one minute though. Like, one book that I highly recommend everybody to read is Less is More by Jason Hickel. It's a relatively recent book that really blew my mind and helped me understand um, how, uh, well, there's no evidence that green growth can take us to this more just, more sustainable, more vibrant world. Um, and it does call for a bit more of a radical rethinking of our systems. I'll leave it that. <laughs> I have a question from Zoom. Oh, someone up there? Do you have a question? Yeah, I did have a question. You're doing a lot of studies in the marine reserves. Are, are, are those studies mirror outside the marine reserves to see how much of the impact is consistent across the, the range and how much is because it's a marine reserve? Yeah, so the ecological monitoring has uh, developed these protocols where they do sampling within the reserve and they all have control sites that are similar habitats that are not, that are open to fishing. So they do have this um, control impact kind of design to the monitoring. Okay. I will say though that uh, the data that I've seen doesn't have a crystal clear take home message at this point. And there's even like, as they really tried to find controls that were similar habitat, but there's still like different species compositions. They're not exactly the same. Like we try to control all variables except for the marine reserve designation, but in the, out in the real world, it's hard to make all things equal except for that one variable. Good question. We have one more. Could you open up? Yeah. So I have um, Margo from Zoom. She's asking, how is ODFW actively inviting Indigenous communities participation? The shellfish program has actually worked for years with... Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Okay. How is ODFW actively working with Indigenous communities to better include them in policy and management planning processes? Uh, there's always room for improvement. I will say, though, that the uh, shellfish program, Steve Rummerill has worked for a long time with um, the selects and the um uh, tribe uh, around negotiating uh, shellfish management. Um, there's still a lot of grappling of, like, how do we do this better and how do we do it well? And I think there's a lot of Honestly, a lot of ODFW people are scared of engaging with Indigenous people because they think they're going to mess it up. And they don't want to mess up and they want to do it right, but they don't feel like they know enough to do it right. So there's initial like seminars that are happening to get us trained up a little bit, but I think we all need to learn more about the history of this place 
and the indigenous history um, and figure out uh, how to build those bridges. And there's a lot of ODFW capacity building that needs to happen in order to do it well, especially in the government to government interactions that we need to have. It's not like tribes are not just a stakeholder and they don't like, we're starting to not even use that language of stakeholder. They're a distinct type of community group that we need to work with and they have special relationships and it needs to be a government to government more formalized interaction. So we're taking baby steps. We have a long ways to go. We don't want to mess it up. And like, uh, personally, I'm hoping to develop this, uh, I've got this idea of, uh, I, I was in grad school in Canada and it's two different tribes that I'm aware of developed uh, a set of principles based on words from their language that embody what stewardship means to that specific cultural group. And I'd like to replicate that if I could in Oregon, but I haven't had the time to develop the relationships in order to get that project off the ground. So like personally, I'm hoping to do that kind of engagement work uh, later, but those relationships take a long time to build and it's easy to mess them up without even intending to do harm in the beginning. So yeah, we're doing what we can. We have a long ways to go. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, it's been very good. And i like to draw attention. You didn't quite get to the goal 19, which is at the bottom of it. <laughs> it was cut off. Which is one of my key stories, which is, it resonates with everyone I can say it, which is protect green biodiversity, current and future generations. If we had that goal in place 150 to 200 years ago, otters would still be in our near shore. That's just one example of a keystone species that is gone in our landscape. So these are things that I have been engaged in, and really the Watershed Council is engaged in our near shore. Because we have three of the five marine reserves, the marine protected areas, in work. So we're engaged in this protection, restoration, and connectivity. That's what we're, we're engaged with. Headwaters, rich top to reef concept. So last thing is your statements about adaptive management, how can we help? If you're serious, we'd like to, and some of us would like to engage in this adaptive management. I will be. We need to figure out a plan for how to do it. So we're working on that. Once we have at least a skeleton of a plan, I am happy to engage this group and you all should be involved in the adaptive management planning process. Any more? Any more Zoom questions? Nope. Okay. Thanks, Sarah.